So Evolution 2.0 has been out how long? Seven years. Seven years. 2015. Okay. So, and you started writing it how long before that? <laughs> Six years before that. So it started in 2009. So I guess we're 13 years okay. post the first hitting and, the keyboard. And all that time leading up to it and the publishing of it, uh, Cancer, you said, gets two pages in here, right? Cancer got two pages, and in the book I said, you'll never understand cancer until you understand evolution. And um, evolution is an active, um, intentional process, and I, and I use the word intentional very deliberately. Mm -hmm. Um, and that cells are intelligence, that cells are intelligent and as long as you underestimate the intelligence of cells and the intelligence of the evolutionary process, as yeah. long as you misreport or misunderstand the evolutionary process, you're never going to understand cancer. And for that matter, you're also never going to understand aging, infectious diseases, mm -hmm. and you know a bunch of other things. And so, you know, I said that in... 2015, and I didn't, I didn't research it a huge amount. I only to the extent to be sure that what I was saying was true, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and I hoped that people would pick up on it um, and say, yeah, that those are good reasons for us to care about this. Um, and then I and then I went on. Okay. So the who was the very first. What was the very first connection between this and cancer? The first like conversation? The first one that I can recall was with Paul Davies. And um, in 2017, Steve Benner, who's a chemist, I was talking to him about getting prize judges and he said, oh, you should talk to Paul Davies. And he introduced us. And I knew who Paul was. Mm -hmm. Paul is a fairly famous physicist and um, he's he's brilliant in his own right and he's done a lot of groundbreaking work and studied with some of the greatest physicists of all time and he's also been a a peaceful voice in the science religion dialogue he's always been one of the reasonable people he's not a particularly religious person so far as I know but he's always you know yeah. gets along with people okay um, well I sent him my book I didn't hear from him for a few months and then all of a sudden I heard back and he said I loved your book especially because of the cancer research that I've done everything that you've said um, goes very nicely with that and I would like to have you come to the Beyond Center and speak at one of our coffee house events uh, about your evolution prize. And uh, when I went to see him in Phoenix, um, he explained to me that a woman that I would later meet uh, named Ann Barker right. uh, reached out to him and said, we would like you to do cancer research. And he said, I don't know anything about right. cancer research. Yeah, and she said, that's just... That's why I want you to hire. <laughs> That's why we want you. Okay. And so he came on board. And so uh, we didn't talk a great deal about that um, other than me noticing that, uh, well, he, he, sent me, he sent me some of his work and I really liked it. And it, it, it accorded with the Evolution 2.0 frame of mind. Um, he, he and Kimberly Bussey showed that cancer appears to be a 600 million year old circuit, that it's a like a protective mechanism when cells get under stress, and okay. it, it goes back you know, hundreds of millions of years to bacteria mm. of having a certain way of responding to stressful situations. And so that was literally the first like real contact with the cancer world. Okay. And, and the work that he and Kim did, I think was really extraordinary. So, um, so that was great, and I spoke at ASU and had a great time meeting the people over there. And then I went on, and and then you know we, we didn't really get into cancer too much anymore. And then two years later, I hear from Jim Shapiro, hmm. and uh, 
he says, hey, I, I'm working with Frank Laukin and Henry Hang, and we want to do this Cancer and Evolution Symposium. Will you help us? And within six months, I was fully immersed in the cancer evolution world. A whole bunch of oncologists and, uh, you know, Paul and Kim were, you know, two of many people now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was almost this right angle turn. Mm -hmm. And I'd been beating the evolution drum and beating the origin of life drum. And now all of a sudden I'm beating the cancer drum. And what I'm finding out is if you want to get people to understand why evolution is important, cancer is a way more powerful emotional hook with way more relevance yeah. to aunt, uncles, children's cousins than, you know, any of this theoretical, historical religious, et cetera, you know, stuff that you usually get with evolution. Mm -hmm. So it's been a really a complete change of scenery. So Anne Barker, is that, that's Anna it? Barker. And yeah. She is the former director, deputy director of the National Cancer Institute. Okay. So quickly, maybe, or it doesn't have to be quickly. Why did this former director of the Cancer uh, Institute want a physicist to do cancer research. So Anna is a truly interdisciplinary woman mm -hmm. who, having worked in government for many years, understands very well how easily large government organizations get entrenched mm -hmm. in certain ways of thinking, knows how that limits possibilities and has always been one to fight for new ways of thinking about problems. Mm -hmm. And so she's always been an advocate for saying, we have to understand how communication and communication theory and information relate to cancer. She picked Paul, as I understand it, because she had read some of his books and uh, in fact one of them's up there and it's a little tiny book it's called how to build a time machine and it's it's not very big it might be 70 or 80 pages and it's only about the size of yeah. your hand and it's a very lay person friendly explanation of all of the rabbit trails that you go down when you ask the question would it be possible to go backwards in time? Yeah. And, you know, from a true blue astrophysicist who, yeah. who, who can go uh -huh. into all of the detail. And she observed, this guy is what in Perry Marshall world we call an interdisciplinary explainer. Mm -hmm. He can go across multiple fields, explain them all in plain English. Those kind of people are the people that most consistently deliver insights. Yep because they know lots of disciplines and they can explain them all in lay language. And that's a sign of genius. And she said, because I've seen you able to do this, I think that I can literally hire you, give you a research project and say, start with a blank sheet of paper and figure out what is cancer. Redefine the disease if you need to. Right. And they did. Yeah. And uh, so he picked Kimberly Bussey, who's a brilliant geneticist, and they did their own bottom of the swamp thing. And and they they did really brilliant work. And he sent me his paper and I read through it. I was like, this, I have never seen this before. This makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so so that was, like I said, that was the very first contact. So And so compare Anna Barker's perspective on cancer and problems in general to what you've experienced with people in the evolutionary bi evolution biology world and <laughs> well so so th there's a positive and a negative mm -hmm. so I'll start with the positive the positive is one of the signs that I was on the right track was that I kept running into people who they they started outside of evolutionary biology, they weren't necessarily biologists, mm -hmm. and 
they came to the same conclusions as me mm -hmm. completely independently of me. Right. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, one of them is John Hands, who wrote a book called Cosmo Sapiens. And his book was mailed to me sometime around the time that Evolution 2.0 came out. I'd never heard of this guy, never met the guy. And the 700-page book shows up. And it was incredibly audacious because the cover letter said, this book explores from the very beginnings of the universe all the way to present day <laughs> and explored like anthropology and physics and the Big Bang and biology and evolution. And, you know, how many of these fields are presented accurately to the public and how many of them need to be torn down to the engine blocks and start over? Yeah. And it was an incredibly audacious hmm book. It was like, man, this guy's got some pretty big cojones if he's going to tackle all of these subjects. But then I started reading it. Yeah. And he got the evolution stuff exactly right. He came to the identical con conclusions that I did. Um, he had identical criticisms as I did. And we'd never talked, we'd never met. And then another person who, who had a very similar journey is Bill Miller, and Bill was a radiologist. Mm -hmm. and by the way, John Hans was, John's John was a academic tutor and a fiction writer and kind of a Renaissance man of sorts, mm -hmm. but a very good researcher. And then Bill Miller, radiologist, and he he comes into evolution and he starts tearing it apart again, nearly identical conclusions. And, and there's others. And so these are examples of people who, in most cases, they come from very practical, get it done kind of backgrounds, like uh, whether it's investigative reporting or like radiology is practicing medicine and it's making patients better. In a lot of ways, practicing medicine is sort of like engineering. You, you care more about the outcome than you care about the theory per yeah, se, right? right? Sure. And so they, this would keep happening. And so I, I would notice that people that were not schooled in the usual path would consistently go, the usual path has all of these really obvious problems. And it seems like people in the field are in some kind of denial. But we can see very clearly that there are these problems and we can actually see a way out of them. It, it wasn't just that they were critics. Yeah. And it wasn't that they just had some religious axe to grind. No, they were trying to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, if we change this assumption and change this assumption and notice these papers that have been written or this research that's been done, there's like a whole nother set of doorways. Let's yeah. walk through them. So let's go back a little bit to um, James Shapiro. Because that what that he was someone that you were talking to and right. knew really well in the evolution when right. you were working on this and had many conversations with him. Um, how much so? But you had not talked to James much about cancer no. at that point. And then no. The, so then after the book comes out, you you have the the ASU with uh, Paul Davies, and then. Jim contacts you, James contacts you about cancer and right. Frank, what's his last name? Frank Laukin. Laukin. Okay. So where did that come from? How did that happen? So I think we all knew, certainly Shapiro and I both knew that cancer was a very deep evolutionary rabbit hole. We both knew that you couldn't understand one without understanding the other, that, that each would give insights. And oh, sorry, by the way, Jim is, is not someone necessarily from the outside. He's, he's within the evolutionary biology world, right? Well, he is and he isn't. Okay. So he's a bacterial geneticist at the University of Chicago where he's been working for 45 years. Mm -hmm. Everybody in genetics knows who he is. He's certainly a widely published, well-respected person, but he's also a renegade. Mm -hmm. um, he's, 
he's called BS on the majority of the evolutionary biology mm -hmm. community for his entire career. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one time I said to him, do your alternate views on things have anything to do with the fact that you studied English at Harvard and then went to Cambridge for genetics hmm. instead of getting a biology degree like most people. And he said, yes, that had everything to do with it because the biology people never had a chance to teach me what I was not allowed to think. Mm -hmm. And I think starting in the liberal arts, but having a mind that was capable of dealing with the science. Right. And starting from liberal arts and then going to science, which is a very unusual path, um, people almost always go the other direction. Mm. He was programmed to question things mm -hmm. and see things from a much wider narrative point of view um, than than most people. Okay. And and so, I think that set him up for a whole different career than most people. So I would say he's been an insider and an outsider Got his it. whole career. Okay. And how did uh, how were he and Frank connected before they connected contacted you? I don't remember the exact story, but what I do know is that I know that Henry Hang is another example. Let me talk about him for a second. So he's at Wayne State University. He's mm -hmm. a cancer research guy. And he figured out just from cancer research, working in his lab, watching cells for years and years, mm -hmm. that there was no possible way that standard evolutionary biology could be right. Okay. Very similar to Dennis Noble working on the heart and coming to the conclusion there's no way standard evolutionary biology could be right. Okay. So Henry wrote this book called Genome Chaos and somewhere in the process of writing that book, discovered, oh, there's this guy named James Shapiro who's come to almost identical conclusions as you. Mm -hmm. Henry knew Frank, and they came together. They decided we need to have a seminar or a meeting, a science conference, okay. and get together all of the cancer people and all the evolution people who think like we do, and then they pulled me in, and that was November of 2019. Right. So we're off to the races. Mm -hmm. And Henry brought some really important insights to the table. So for example, as an example, he figured out that th there's this mystery of why do we even have sexual reproduction in the first place? If you go into deep evolutionary biology and you start reading the literature and you say, why would sexual reproduction even evolve? Because it makes it a lot harder to reproduce than just dividing off another cell. Yeah, right. Okay, so what function does this really serve? Henry's conclusion was it adds an incredible amount of stability to a species. Okay. So let me explain why he says that. A bunch of the information that is needed to build an organism is contained not in the code of the DNA, but in the three-dimensional structure of the chromosomes. Okay. So most people don't ever even think about this for a split second. Okay. But your DNA is not just a linear string of data like you would find on a hard drive. Mm -hmm. Think of an entire chromosome or set of chromosomes as a three-dimensional hard drive okay. with these very fantastical fractal shapes. And which parts are close to the surface and which parts are buried deep and which parts are easily accessible um, contains a whole bunch of information about the order in which it needs to be read and processed and structured. Okay. And it has to be unfolded and then refolded back as it's read. And think of 
think of the cellular machinery um, that reads and, and writes the DNA, which is happening constantly. Think of it like three-dimensional hard drive heads that are moving all around it. Okay. Yeah. While you're alive in, in real time. Okay. He said, the only way a mother and a father can successfully reproduce is if the three-dimensional shapes, which is called the karyotype, mm -hmm. match. Okay. Okay, so if a deer mates with an antelope, mm -hmm. there are typical explanations for why they don't, they, that doesn't work. Like, oh, they had a different number of chromosomes. Mm -hmm. But what Henry points out is, well, most people don't pay any attention to this, but if the three-dimensional shape of that hard drive yeah. doesn't match, right. then when they try to mate, it's not going to work. Okay. The end result of this is that the requirement of males and females mating locks a successful species into a body plan and lineage that only has a narrow range of variation, which is why, you know, cockroaches haven't changed very much in 400 million years and yeah. rats haven't hardly changed in 50 million years. Mm -hmm. Rats and cockroaches are obviously very, very successful mm -hmm. species. He said, people don't understand the importance of preserving this structure. And so he figured this out from studying cancer and how cancer cells wreak havoc. Like they do, they do massive changes, not only on the genetic level, but at the chromosome level okay. and at this three dimensional level, which not one cancer researcher in a hundred even talks about. Mm -hmm. And so this would be an example of, this is a very important piece of the evolutionary puzzle mm -hmm. that now the evolution people need to pay attention to as well. And he just provided an explanation for why sexual reproduction exists and is so successful, even though intuitively it seems like a much harder right. uh, way to go forward mm -hmm. because it produces very sophisticated animals that stay stable. Okay. And then we can, we can furthermore have a better understanding of how do we occasionally get a new species mm -hmm. by doing various things which we describe in our books. So all of this is getting enriched and, and I'm seeing that as this conversation between the cancer people and the evolution people happen, the cancer people are getting a much better theoretical framework in which to ask questions and the evolution people are getting a real-time high-speed laboratory that where you can literally from one day to the next see how evolutionary processes are, are moving. And so the, the, the two, these two fields absolutely have to talk to each other. So we put together this organization and what we also found out was there was at least half a dozen people who had already done this. They'd already had conferences, they had already had meetings like this, they already had special groups, and they all had a certain amount of effectiveness, but they had never gotten it over the tipping point to where both professions, mm -hmm. in a larger sense, said, hey, this is important, let's pay attention. Our project got enough of these people under one roof that the critical mass happened, and then American Association of Cancer Research showed up mm -hmm. and said, we like what you're doing, let's make you a working group. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these communities finally came together. Why did it come together this time when it hadn't come together before? So let me put on my business and marketing hat mm -hmm. rather than my biology hat. Sure. I think the science was already there and it was already valid. Mm -hmm. And it had been for years. And in fact, we all kind of knew this. I think it was because 
the right combination of people showed up this time. So I, so several people that I think were key to making it work. First was Frank. Mm -hmm. Frank is a CEO of a Fortune 1000 corporation. He know, almost like knows everybody at Harvard and MIT. Yep. And his connectedness yep. was a major, sure. major factor. I don't think hardly any scientist could do that unless they were a real rock star. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem with a, a science rock star is they're already embedded in their existing structure, yeah. right? And so Frank was a little bit of an outsider. Yep. I think that was a key. Um, I think that people like Azra Raza and George Church coming on board, mm -hmm. even just to do the cancer symposium, George hasn't been involved since then, but Azra has. Yeah. Um, it was just enough people and just enough extra mojo that the dominoes started following. And I mean, we got every single speaker that we wanted, except for one guy who was a Pulitzer Prize winner and he was just a little too much of a rock star to come and do our thing. But I mean, everybody else that we asked, as far as I know, you know, they said yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think this was incredibly important because I think we literally are in a position to potentially change the way that cancer is defined in medical schools and textbooks. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not there yet, but I think most of the cancer and evolution people would agree that defining cancer as evolution running out of control in your own body mm -hmm. is a more all-encompassing definition and a more accurate definition of cancer than a hundred other definitions that are floating around out there. Mm -hmm. And it's very different than like what you find out if you look it up in a dictionary. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have a large organization like AACR to get something like that propagated into the wider mm -hmm. community. So that's one of the things that I think will happen with time. Okay. So it connecting with these people and it uh, comes to this uh, conference. What if you had to say like, in you know, what's the elevator speech version of what the conference accomplished? The summit or whatever. What was it called? The Cancer and Evolution Symposium. Symposium. Yeah, that symposium. We got the best people in cancer and evolution who agree that cancer has been incorrectly defined and it has to be defined in terms of evolution and who agree that evolution has in, been incorrectly defined right. and is an active intentional process rather than some passive right survival of the fittest thing we got agreement on both of those things at a blue chip level in science mm -hmm. harvard oxford mit right columbia you know the uh, md anderson the very best research centers in the world and we we got that level of street cred which is now producing an entire vein of research that clearly defines these things differently and is making very clear, tangible progress because of those better definitions. Mm -hmm. Like, I, it's, it's not any accident that we are on the cusp of detecting cancer at stage negative one. Yep. We are reversing cancer after it's been induced in animals that's a very big deal we are figuring out the relationship between cortisol and cancer and now we we have a new project um that that michael levin's been working on where he's showing early indications that existing drugs applied in a new way can greatly slow down glioblastoma, which right. is one of the worst cancers you can possibly get. It's a brain cancer. Mm -hmm. And so there, there keeps being new things coming to the surface yeah. at a much faster pace yeah. than what I see outside of this group. Yeah. 
So back to the symposium, what is the, what were the first, I guess, uh, contacts, connections, relationships, or whatever that came out from the symposium for you? Well, one of the first ones was Shapiro told all of us, you guys have to read this book, The First Cell by Isra Raza. Okay. Okay, I buy the book. I read the book. So that was before the symposium or that was this, after? It was before the symposium. Before, right. Um, and um, I don't remember how he got a hold of that book, but he did. And he started reading it. And, and I was really impressed. And so I reached out to Azra and I said, would you come on my podcast and talk to me about your book? Yep. And to my incredible surprise, she emails me back and she goes, is this the Perry Marshall? <laughs> and I said, yeah, how on earth does an oncologist in New York City have any idea who I am? Yeah. And she says, well, you wrote 80-20 sales and marketing in Evolution 2.0 and you have this audacious prize, and you wrote about my heroes, Barbara McClintock and Lynn Margulis. Mm -hmm. And I come to find out she's been fascinated with evolution yeah. since she was 11, okay. living in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And she always believed that evolution was incorrectly characterized as this random accidental process. Yep. And so she had always been keeping an eye on the evolution literature and when evolution 2.0 came out it got her attention mm -hmm. and she read it of course i had no idea who she was and so we we get on this podcast and we instantly hit it off and what i think we both had in common is we were both deeply dissatisfied with the status quo her in cancer yes. treatment yep. me in evolution right and we were both call out the elephant in the room people. Yeah. My, my biggest question to her was, how did you get away with writing this book? And how did you not get you know, body slammed yeah. for telling everybody that cancer research basically isn't working? Yeah. And the answer was, I've lived it. I've lost a husband to cancer. I've lost my daughter's best friend to cancer, I've treated 60,000 patients, I have their tissue samples, I've been published in every major journal. Nobody can call BS on me with a straight face and they yeah. all know it. Yeah. Wow, right? And similarly, like I was a complete outsider and I, I asked myself the question, there is so much nonsense in this field, I have to figure out how to get myself taken seriously. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? And the, the answer was $10 million prize with the best judges that you can find in the world announced at the Royal Society. If I can get enough blue chip confirmation that mm -hmm. what I'm doing is valid, nobody will be able to argue with me and it'll be a 10 second conversation. Like, well, did anybody win the money yet? Is anybody even eligible to win the money yet? Right. No. Question not answered, so we're not you know, we're not accepting these silly little stories anymore. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to. And so we both admired each other for being, you know, the, the emperor has no clothes person. How much did you know about how little progress had been made in like stage four cancer before well, you started down this path? Not that much. I couldn't have. I mean, I have a whole elevator speech now yeah. about how. Most people in stage four are no better now than they were 100 years ago. I didn't have that elevator speech. I just knew the experience that most of us have, yeah. which is we, ha we have all these friends, and yeah, if they catch it on the early side, a lot of times they can, right. they can straighten it out. And we all know people that have survived cancer and gone on and been okay, yeah. but we also know how hopeless some of the other people were yeah. so yeah i didn't really know mm -hmm. um but but that was one of the first things that came out early in our as we started putting this thing together it was like this is not a pretty situation mm -hmm. in fact 
speaking as a marketer, it was almost like a copywriter's dream because it's like, is there a reason why we should be doing something differently? Is there a reason why we should be dissatisfied? Yes, mm -hmm. like yes with megaphones. Yeah, and Osra was, I know, I know we've said in several places several times that with certain types of cancer, she's like the the the, the process for or the what's the word I'm looking for the, the treatment for that hasn't changed in forty years. Yeah, in the case of some of her leukemias, 1977, wow. and there there's there's lots of cancers where whatever they're doing. It's the same thing they were doing in 1975, 1983, 1987. Or if, it's, if it's different, the the only difference is that the people are living two weeks longer, or two months longer, or whatever. But right. Yeah. Right. And and so um, it's just so distressing. And and one of my very close friends is going through chemo right now, and they say. If these doctors had to take the medications I'm having to take, mm -hmm. they would be working a lot harder to find something better, because mm -hmm. you know I can't swallow. Like I can't. You know, there there are all these, yeah, things. So you read the Azra book. Azra comes to the symp. You start talking with Azra. She comes to the symposium, and then she um, became our keynote, which right. was. A great, great. And then after the symposium with Azra, what happens? So the the first thing that I noticed was we had Q and A calls, optional Q and As, the week or two after the symposium, and any one of our presenters who wanted to field questions could get on a second Zoom. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I noticed was there is a rabid, active, like can't get enough group of scientists. They are coming on every one of these calls and having incredibly yep. engaging conversations. And the, the curiosity is fantastic. And you know, maybe the call is an hour and a half and they're staying for the whole hour and a half. I mean, they've got lots of things to do. They're very busy people, right? So that was the first thing. The second thing was I get a call from this guy. I didn't know him very well, but I met him at a science conference a few years ago and I had invited him and he's been working in the pharmaceutical business for 30 years. And he, he says, Perry, that was the best science conference I have attended in 30 years. Wow. And I go, really? I mean, I've been to a, I don't know, 10 science conferences? I haven't been to 100. Right. He says, no, that was seriously good. And I said, why? And basically his explanation was, 95% of science conferences are a person who's a specialist in one field going very deep in one thing. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the next person, they go very deep in something else. Yep. And he goes, the presenters at your conference were a different type of person. They were all the kind of people who rather than just staying in their lane and, and in their cubicle and drilling deeper, 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 they were all the kind of people who stand up in the vast cubicle farm and they mm -hmm. look around and they go, so what does this have to do with that guy over there and that guy over there and that guy over there? And like, does anybody in here know the answer to this question, this question, this question, this question? Yeah. And he said, almost everybody that was presenting was that type of person. And those, like 95% of scientists are not that person. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is what made it so interesting. And, and to kind of underscore that a little bit, on the third day of the conference, I was the chairperson. And so I was managing the conversations and so, we were in the home stretch and all the presenters had come back to do open Q and A. And so I, I had all of these 
presenters and scientists on a big zoom and you could see all their you know yeah. all their pictures and I said I would like to see a show of hands how many of you are a little embarrassed to admit that you only understood about 30% of everything that you heard today mm -hmm. and all these hands went up and I said that's good because mm -hmm. everybody is being stretched out of their comfort yeah. zones and we have probably 40 different scientific specialties represented here all the way from oncology to physics and every and chemistry and everything in between and we all have to speak english yeah to each other right. which means we're reinforcing that so everybody stand up in your cubicle and see the other people standing up in their cubicles mm -hmm. and like we all need to, can we go to the lunch room and have a conversation yeah and that was so elating or, or like uh th there was another scientist who I already knew to be absolutely world-class and I just happened to ask him a few weeks later you presented at the symposium did you attend he said oh yes he said I only missed a few minutes here and there I attended the whole thing yeah and I said really he said yes he said that was a great yeah event he said it was worth my time and he's a very busy guy and so I knew that we really had something here and we needed to keep it going. And so we did and we started having Zoom meetings every month. And now we have usually over 100 people on every single one. And the AACR working group has 1,500 scientists who have signed on mm -hmm. as members. Um, so that's I mean, for a scientific society, that's really good. That's a lot of scientists. And that concept is, it sounds like it's its not that well known in the scientific world, but if you, I don't know if you want to talk about this much, but from your business consulting side, that's a concept that you're very familiar with and have, been, have known about for a long time, right? Yes. Getting people in a room that don't have the same business and... Yes, so this does not seem to be very common outside of the entrepreneur or marketing space. But, you know, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, in, in the high end of marketing circles, um, one of the favorite formats for education is called the mastermind group. And at its best, it's when you have eight, 10, 12, 15 people in a room, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, software developer, um, owns a gym, uh, owns a chain of restaurants, um, you, know, you name it. Yeah. And everybody shows up and typically you're there for a couple of days and, you know, we're having meals together and, and, but in, in the meeting time, the main entertainment is, all right, John, you're up. You got an hour. Last time we we're here was four months ago. We're back again. I want you to tell us what you're doing, mm -hmm. what worked, what didn't work, how was your quarter, yeah. what problems are you running into? And, and so it, it's almost like an informal board of directors. And if, if you own a chain of medical clinics, you have to explain to a guy who owns a bowling alley yep. what you're doing yep. and why. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, very common in small business circles for these to happen. And they're, they're typically expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you, you'll almost always pay more than $10,000 a year to be a part of one of these. Yeah. It takes a lot of gravity to get all those people in a room together, and they all have to be smart. Like, you can't have half really smart people and half really dumb people, or it ruins the experience. And yeah. so it just tends to be expensive. And as far as I can tell, this is not done in a lot of other industries, yeah. but I'm completely used to it, mm -hmm. right? And, and so I think what Anna Barker was doing mm -hmm and has always been trying to do is a 
science version of that. Mm -hmm. And I think the Cancer and Evolution group is a science version of that because even though a lot of those people are oncologists or they're in cancer research, they're in so many different branches of cancer research and there's a pr an appreciable number of people who do not come from any of the standard categories. You know, they are literally yeah. astrophysicists or chemists or information theorists or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And so I think the evolution thread brings a lot of other fields into the conversation that wouldn't otherwise be there. And so I have this hope that what appears to be the beginning of a mastermind concept mm -hmm. will continue to get richer and richer as we go along. Okay. And your, so your relationship with Osro develops after more, even more after the symposium and what's the, what's, what exciting things is she doing? I know we've talked about it before, but yeah, but what it needs it needs to be said. So, Azra and I did a brilliant podcast together called "How to Detect Cancer at Stage Negative One," and Azra has come to the conclusion that. Cancer cells come from something that's called a giant cell, which is a cell that has been stressed out and because of the stress has started generating multiple copies of its own genome and in many cases has done a merger acquisition with other cells. And so you have these big cells in very small quantities, mm -hmm. but they are all, they always seem to be present. It's like, oh yeah, you know, we noticed that these are there, but they don't seem to be doing anything. It's been in the literature since 1911. Wow. And her, Azra, Jin Song Lu, Kenneth Pienta, and some other people are firmly convinced that these are the mothers of cancer cells and that chemotherapy doesn't kill them. Right. You could, you could eradicate the cancer and you could be in remission, but those giant cells are still there. Mm -hmm. That if you take them out, you can prevent recurrence of cancer. And if you take them out early, you can prevent cancer from even happening. Now, they haven't quite proven this. Right. But all of the dots seem to be connecting in that direction. And it's incredibly promising uh, for both preventing cancer early on, detecting yeah. cancer early on, because Azra has figured out how to paint a red bullseye on a giant cell. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is a huge, huge breakthrough. And so we're working with her on that. Yep. That's a whole deep conversation. and. You know, if you're interested in supporting it or learning more, you can contact our office and we can arrange to get you more information. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most exciting things I've seen. Um, I, I've come to the conclusion that the medical profession has incorrectly defined cancer, mm -hmm. incorrectly defined evolution, and incorrectly defined malignancy. Mm. I believe that a problem clearly defined is 95% solved or so to speak. Yeah. Right. Right. I don't know if the number is 95%, but I, I think any problem is more half, more than half solved once you correctly defined it. I believe we have correct definitions and based on those definitions. So one of our definitions of malignancy, in other words, I have, I just found out I, I have a tumor and everybody wants to know, is it benign or malignant? Right. The definition of malignancy is starting with a giant cell. Okay. And that is not how most of the cancer profession defines right. cancer. So I, I think we have the right definition. And so now it's just a matter of following that up mm -hmm. with 
petri dish experiments and then animal experiments and eventually clinical trials. Sure. So where did you meet um, Michael Levin? Was that before the symposium? Yes. Mm -hmm. Michael was introduced to me by Paul Boschman, and Paul is the technical manager of Evolution 2.0. He's like the software website guy and deals with the customer relationship management system. And Paul is a chemical engineer. And engineers always have a very particular reaction when they read evolution literature because they know that at least a third of it makes no sense and it couldn't possibly work. <laughs> right. Um, and, and so Paul loved Evolution 2.0. And so one day I get this email from Paul. Perry, you got to, got to, got to, got to, got to interview this guy on your podcast. Watch these videos. Okay. Michael Levin, Tufts University. So I, I watched probably an hour and a half long video that Paul sent me. I was really impressed. Oh my goodness. This guy is working on really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's really redefining biology. And so I got in touch with him and we did a podcast interview. And uh, along the way, I invited him to speak at our symposium, which he did. He gave a fantastic presentation. And to put it bluntly, I think Michael is 10 years ahead of just about everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a very different understanding of what makes biology tick. Mm -hmm. He defines the fundamental questions differently. And I got to say, it, it's another example of what I already talked about where somebody from some other field shows up and says, here's mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense. I see a better way of doing it. In his case, he came to biology from computer science. Okay. And originally he thought that computer science was going to give us artificial intelligence. Yeah. And he came to the conclusion that there is no real AI in mm -hmm. computer science. Okay. The real AI is what biology is doing. And what Michael would say is, Michael would say, Biology is a branch of computer science, like the, the way that he likes to think about it. But biology has tricks up its sleeve mm -hmm. that none of the computer science guys have ever comprehended or understand. Like there, it, there are yeah. missing laws of physics. There's, you know, dark matter, so to speak, that we don't understand how it works. Yeah. And he wants to understand that. And so because he's an experimentalist and at heart an engineer, mm -hmm. and also I would add an entrepreneur because mm -hmm. he was an entrepreneur before he got into computer yeah. science. He approaches questions at a fundamentally different level than almost any standard trained scientist. So he is another one of these half insider, half outsider yeah. people. And so, we hit it off, and since then we've had a great working relationship, and Science Research 2.0 has been supporting his lab, and um, so he's, he's reversing cancer in tadpoles, he is figuring out what are the relationships between what goes on in an amphibian versus what goes on in a human, he's got early indications of being able to make headway on geoblastoma, which is one of the hardest cancers in the world. Um, so I'm really happy with what Michael is doing. And I think by the time the larger scientific world figures out yeah. what he's on to, he will have probably made some major contributions mm -hmm. to medicine, and certainly, you know, the funny thing about me is I am personally more interested in the underlying theories and principles than I am in the practice of medicine mm -hmm. because I see the world in this much bigger picture lens. Yes, I would love to see that suffering cancer patient yeah. get better, but 
I'm more interested in understanding how do we prevent a million people from even being cancer patients yeah. by correcting the long-standing problems in science that haven't been solved? Yeah. Because I think at the root of our misunderstanding of life and evolution, if we can get these things right, humanity will get pushed into a whole new mm -hmm. era. Yeah. And then the, the other exciting research that's going on is in the area of the effects of cortisol on cancer? Yes, so I have two people working on that. So one of them is Eric Kulker, who's a psychologist, mm -hmm. and Kimberly Bussey, who is the woman who worked with Paul Davies on yep. like a fresh approach to cancer. Yeah. And so she's a geneticist and she and Eric are doing research on what is the relationship between cortisol, which is the stress yeah. chemical, right? Um, that you know when you when you slam on your brakes and you almost rear end somebody, it's that you know yeah. that flush that goes through um, cortisol and cancer. The connection between those two has never been adequately researched, and they are going down that rabbit hole. And I'm surprised. But not surprised. I was going to say, is it that you said earlier when you're talking about how cancer starts or how it begins, or whatever, it's like, okay, a cell is gets stressed somehow. Yes. So you would think, oh, yes. well, then let's study, study the stress hormone. <laughs> cancer is a combination of stressors combined with the body's declining ability to manage itself. Yeah. And they come together. And so the stressors could be the bad marriage, the job that sucks, the yeah. pollution, the, you know, the, you know, the, the alcohol abuse, the smoking, like it, it could be yeah. any of those things. Um, it, it could be the garbage inside your head that you never figured out. And that collides with, as you get in your 50s, 60s, 70s, your yeah. body is less and less able to keep things under control. And so rogue cells yeah. start going rogue right and so surely an in-depth understanding of how cortisol relates to where in you know how do these steps work and is there a place where we can intercept that or change the whole story mm -hmm. So who knows what's going to come out of that? And, and one of the things that Eric brings to the table, and I have a great podcast with him that people should listen to, is as a clinical psychologist, he knows that adverse childhood events like trauma, rape, incest, you know, physical abuse, people with more than a certain number of those in their history are three to four times more likely to have heart disease and cancer mm. than people that have not had those experiences. But furthermore, people that have had adverse child events who've been through therapy and talked through it, their rates of cancer and heart disease go down. Yeah. So I just described four or five things that to me are blazingly obvious. Mm -hmm highly productive, high return on investment areas of research where I believe that a dollar put into these projects will go 10 to 100 times farther yeah. than a dollar given to less research, more genetic mutations that have yeah. oncogenes or... You know, I just think most of the cancer industry is stuck in this rut. We are not in that rut. And we need help. Um, we don't have a billion dollar war chest. We'd like to. Yeah. It's not outside the realm of possibility that we could. There are very successful, very wealthy people who get our newsletters and listen to our podcasts. We need help on all of these things. And it is showing, so 
I have been actively funding cancer research projects now for one year. Okay. And if you compare what I could tell you a year ago to yeah. what I just told you now, right. huge progress. So talk a little bit about, okay, you just, you said, I just explained, I just, a whole bunch of things that are blazingly obvious, and then you've got research going on that shows some promise in reversing cancer. And right. then you've got some research going on that shows promise in detecting cancer before most people would even call it cancer. Yes. So you, and then, then the cortisol stuff, which is, okay, it's stress. That's, you know, that right. seems obvious. Uh, right. These things obvious. So why is it so hard for these amazing, obvious things to get funding? <laughs> Nobody can appreciate this better than a professional marketer. Okay. So putting on my business hat, consulted in 300 industries, I can't even count how many butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, I get into a consultation with them, I go, oh, John, the problem is you're selling prevention. Mm -hmm. And prevention is 16 times harder to sell than a cure. Yeah. You're gonna have to sell a cure and work yourself backwards to prevention. Yeah. Okay, so now this is just, this is basic marketing 101 yeah. that anybody can understand that if a guy is having a heart attack right now and his arm is throbbing and he's laying on the floor and he knows he's about to die, yeah. uh, that'll be a quarter of a million dollars sold. Right. Right. It takes no persuasion. Right skills whatsoever when the guy is dying of yes. a heart attack. Rewind five years and the same guy, and he's overweight, and he eats too many cheeseburgers, and you say, well, I don't know if it's biking or yoga or change a diet or what, but mm -hmm. like, you're a heart attack waiting to happen. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. not interested, not interested. Right, and even, not interested even if it's, so it's a quarter million when he's having it. Right. But you say, I can I can help you avoid that, and it's only gonna cost you. $25 a yeah. month. Right, exactly. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> right. right, yeah. Okay, and we all know this, right? So I believe that since it costs a lot of money for individuals, mm -hmm and insurance companies, and governments, and communities to treat people in stage four so they can live six weeks longer and be miserable. Yeah. We ought to have the wherewithal to stop and say, these guys at Science Research 2.0 are actually doing something about this. Mm -hmm. And we need to help them. Yeah. And you know, I don't really care if it's grants or foundations or government or wealthy individuals or not so wealthy individuals. I don't. I don't really care where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. It's frankly going to come from all of these places. Yeah. But this is worthy of your time and attention. And I bet half the people listening to this are going in the next two months, you're gonna hear about another close friend or relative who just got the diagnosis, yeah. and now they're on that path. And I think we can make more progress in the next 10 years than was total made in the last 50 by addressing the right problems instead of the wrong ones. And right now, all the money is going into the late stage stuff. 90% of the money is long after the horse is out of the barn and when frankly very little can be done about it. Right. And we are going to the roots and I just I just keep getting confirmation. We're on the right track. We're on the right track. We're on the right track. I, and it's really exciting. It's exciting and it's frustrating because I know what we could do mm -hmm. so much faster mm -hmm. with more resources.